they are very specific about how they believe the, the world will end and how the caliphs will play into that. One way or another, 2076 is going to be the expiration date for the world. <laughs> Hi, I'm Raihan Salam. This week, Vice meets Graham Wood, author of a recent series of articles about the Islamic State. Now, Graham, the Islamic State has gone by a number of different names. Tell us the significance of that name, the Islamic State. Well, uh, it's now known as the Islamic State after shedding the last two of the letters in its initials, ISIS, when it was the Islamic State in Iraq and Sham, which is the word for the Levant, Syria and Lebanon. And it took off those last two words because uh, it now considers itself the only Islamic State and the only rightful claimant to the title of Islamic State. It also uh, refuses to acknowledge national boundaries. The, the, the title of state is really one that is in some ways a misnomer because it believes that states don't exist and there is really only one Islamic entity and it is it. So essentially all other states, all other countries that we see on the map are to them uh, arbitrary, are uh, you know, uh, not legitimate. Yes, they're fictions. They're very happy to, to show how the boundary between Iraq and Syria is now erased now that the Islamic State controls the territory on both sides of that border. And it wants to see every other border eliminated. Islam has, um, you know, over a billion adherents worldwide, uh, and there are many different flavors uh, of Islam. Now, uh, uh, tell us a bit about the flavor of Islam that uh, that the Islamic State adheres to. The Islamic State adheres to a, a type of Islam called Salafism, and Salafism is a fairly obscure historically. Uh, version of Islam that harkens back to the very first centuries of Islam. So the time of Muhammad and his, his, uh, his successors, his immediate companions, and really the first three generations of Muslims in the world. So what the Islamic State would like to do is to take the examples of these pious forefathers and create a state based on their example, their law, and the way they governed. Tell us where, I mean, what is the heartland of Salafi Islam? Well, it's, it's primarily associated with Saudi Arabia, whose state religion is called Wahhabism, which is similar to but not quite identical to Salafi Islam. Wahhabism is uh, generally adhering to uh, the Hanbali school of Sunni interpretation of Islamic law. Salafism is slightly different in that it rejects all interpretation, all clerical interpretation of Islamic law, and suggests that really the only thing we can do is, in a profoundly anti-clerical way, look directly at the text of the Quran and the example of the, of the Prophet Muhammad and his companions, it's been isolated to a backwater of, of Arabia, not to the, to the uh, central traditions of Islam. And it's something that's been very unpopular, uh, a, a very strange doctrine, in fact, to most Muslims. The idea that you can understand the Quran directly by reading it rather than through the intermediaries uh, who are, are scholars who study it all the time is actually a rejection of almost all of Islamic history. It is, however, in its own way, um, very punctilious in its association with Islam, in that it really does uh, look at the Quran in, in, a, in a very close way. Now, the reason it's arisen so prominently now is partly through the Saudi example. There's much uh, from Wahhabism that can be taken by Salafis and, uh, and, and used and, and agreed with. Um, but most of all, it, it gives to its adherents uh, a sense of purity and a, a real sense that they are chosen on earth. They even use a phrase, the chosen sect. Um, looking back at one of these traditions of the prophet, that there's one that says that there are 73 sects in all of Islam and only one is the true one. So for them to say, we are the true one, is not, uh, it doesn't seem to them very odd that they would be the only Muslims in their view, who are true Muslims and everybody else is consigned to hellfire. Uh, 
ونرمي عليهم بفضل الله سبحانه وتعالى ونرجو من الله سبحانه وتعالى بفضله وكرمه ان يمكننا منهم ان شاء الله To what extent can we attribute the rise of Wahhabism to the material wealth of Saudi Arabia? Uh, somewhat. So there's, uh, there are texts that, that um, are distributed by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia that are sent out that are very congenial to the Salafi interpretation. That said, the Salafis reject the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in many ways. Uh, they believe, especially the Islamic State, that there's only one true Islamic government and that is led by the Islamic State. So uh, the, the Saudi state would claim, would, would claim to the Salafis that we are the Muslim government that you seek. To what extent is the rise of these austere interpretations of Islam connected to the uh, spectacular explosion of oil wealth in the Arab Middle East? To some extent, yes. There are um, sources of, of publishing and literature that the Saudi government uh, propagates, and these are very congenial to the interpretations of Salafis. But really, I would say that what's most important to this spread is that Salafis are able to look within themselves and find great power. They're empowered personally because they don't need the intermediary of, of a state or of clerics. And they can feel that they personally are connected to God. Um, the sense of purity that that gives them is really what fuels them more than anything else. The Islamic State has also capitalized on uh, the chaos and lawlessness that still persists in much of Iraq. You had spent some time in Iraq in the mid-2000s, and I'm curious as to your impressions of religious belief among those you had interacted with uh, on the ground. I would say that Iraq in general w was not any more or less religious in my experience than many other parts of the Middle East. Uh, and of course, many of the parts that are very religious are Shia. Um, and the places that I've been most recently in Iraq, where, where I've found the strongest devotion, have been in places like Najaf and Karbala, which are the, the heartland of Shia Islam. Uh, now, tell us a bit about uh, the different fighters who've rallied around the cause of the Islamic State. You've identified three broad groups that have uh, taken up the cause. Uh, how are they different? Well, the first group is the one that we see the most, and that's a group I call the psychopaths. Uh, we see them the most because really that's what they do. Uh, they show up from often from overseas, not necessarily from the Western world, but places like Egypt. And uh, they're very good at Twitter. They're not so good at fighting. And we see them beheading people. We see heads in buckets, that sort of thing. Fairly small group. Um, the second group I call the true believers. And this would certainly include Baghdadi, the caliph himself. These are people who, whose uh, beliefs about Islam and about the predictions of a caliphate and the Islamic legal requirements of obedience to a caliph, that, that's what motivates them to, to join. I also think that's a fairly small group, although it does include many of the top members of, of ISIS. And then the largest group by far is uh, Sunni pragmatists. And these are the disaffected Sunnis from Syria and Iraq. Um, they. Um, certainly don't have the same ideological uh, inclinations, but they do believe that their prosperity and security requires a Sunni government, uh, or at least some enormous guarantee from, from outsiders to keep the Shiite-led government of Iraq from uh, depredations against them. So if there were some way to peel off the Sunni pragmatists by demonstrating that there is another force uh, that might uh, provide Sunnis with security, uh, that might provide them with the resources that they had been denied uh, under the earlier arrangements with the, the Shia Iraqi government, you think that ISIS could be badly undermined? Yes, I think so. Uh, but that's a very big if. There's no one in Iraq right now who can credibly guarantee the safety of Sunnis. It once could have fallen to the United States government and its coalition. But uh, right now, we just don't have the power to do that. We don't have people there, and we aren't ready to funnel in the money or the guns that they'd require to feel really safe. One thing I also wonder about is that uh, if the United States uh, and its allies were to engage uh, in a kind of all-out conflict with the Islamic State, to some degree that might lend the Islamic State a greater legitimacy. Is that fair to say? As I said before, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State don't get along so well. And the Islamic State wants to show that it's the new generation and the one that, sh that people should go to if they want to fight against the United States. The best way to, to confirm that impression is to um, breathlessly describe uh, the importance of destroying this, what's still really a small group of people in an impoverished backwater of Arabia. They're actually very thrilled if, if they are promoted to the top ranks of jihadis. 
um, by the intervention of foreigners and the attention of people like Barack Obama. And so as an ideological matter, it might make sense for the United States to act primarily through proxies in the region, uh, you know, because that would not lend the Islamic State the same legitimacy? Is that what you're getting at? Yes, I think so. If we were to use proxies such as Kurds, such as Iraqi Shia forces, there are obviously very big problems with that too. Um, but it would at least not be quite the same propaganda coup for Baghdadi when he's claiming that he is the number one uh, enemy of the West. So what does happen if the Islamic State is dislodged from its territory? I think we're already seeing what happens when that happens. Namely, that the Islamic State ceases to be a state and becomes probably more like Al-Qaeda. Uh, it's already talked about, although it hasn't actually accomplished this, ways to inflict pain on the West through terrorist acts. And that is a predictable way for an organization to, to sort of scatter to the wind and, and cause the problems that it can. It's also a success. Um, Al-Qaeda is really something we've been able to manage over the last decade or so. And it's, uh, it's an example that, that we should hope that, that the Islamic State has to emulate. Because you know, a few attacks here and there, although that's too many, it's something that we've been able to manage. So um, having, them, having them reduced to that is uh, much better than having them control a whole swath of territory that allows them to look like a state and act like one. Now, we're assuming that uh, the Islamic State will somehow be rolled back, that uh, you know, its uh, power will deteriorate over time. But what would it look like for the Islamic State to succeed? It would mean the expansion of the state until it covers the entire world. Uh, it, would, it, it would mean uh, the execution of vast numbers of uh, apostates, unbelievers, Shia. And slowly, the borders of the Islamic State would, would expand until uh, the world of Islam encompassed everywhere. The conventional reading of recent Iraqi history is that, uh, you know, the fall of Saddam Hussein um, after the U.S.-led invasion um, had basically led to a kind of intercommunal civil war, pitting different communities against each other. Now, it seems that this created an opportunity for groups like al-Qaeda in Iraq and then later the Islamic State. Um, but tell us a bit about that. I mean, you know, why would the Sunnis turn to these kind of uh, outside uh, Salafi-led groups? Well, first they turned against them, of course. During the awakening in Iraq, the Salafi groups and the jihadi groups were driven out. So uh, the important turn was when the United States left Iraq. And for good or ill, when the, when the United States left Iraq, they no longer had an ability to control Sunni tribes with money and security. The Sunni tribes of Anbar, as a result of that, were uh, really left to the predations of Shia-led government from Baghdad. Uh, and that's what we're seeing now with the rise of the Islamic State. They're able to cover and increase their, their territory in part because the Sunni heartland of Iraq is, uh, has been neglected enough so that it has very little security in it, and it has very little to lose, um, either financially or in security, from allowing the Islamic State to cover it. So it was, the Islamic State could very easily roll into these cities, execute a few, um, few key figures, and then uh, require the loyalty of uh, the common Sunni people there. Now, when you talk about the predation of the Shia-dominated Iraqi state, uh, was this a kind of active predation or was it simply a neglect of the needs of these communities? It's both active predation and neglect. So during the late period of the occupation, the United States was first of all pouring great, a great deal of money into Anbar province uh, and specifically into the sheikh structures that had, had gotten along so well actually with Saddam Hussein. So that money uh, simply stopped. Um, but there were also things like the Sons of Iraq program, which allowed homegrown security forces of the Sunnis to keep control over cities, towns in Anbar. Uh, that also stopped. So suddenly, where does security come from? It comes largely from forces of Shia soldiers who are coming in, who are unwelcome, and uh, they're now kicked out by ISIS. So you have al-Qaeda in Iraq, then the Sunni tribes turn against it uh, with the help of the United States. Then 
the U.S. leaves, then suddenly the Islamic State starts to emerge. Where exactly did the Islamic State itself come from? It's a combination of the wreckage of Iraq, the chaos of Iraq, and even more so the chaos of Syria. So looking at states or cities in Syria, such as Raqqa, uh, th these were over a year ago taken over by what's now the Islamic State. And the fact that they were able to hold territory and actually control places and, and function really as a state was allowing them to create a rallying point for uh, like-minded Salafi jihadis. And uh, those, those groups, once they were put together, organized, were able to roll then into Iraq, obliterate the border and take over cities like Mosul and parts of Crete. So is the heart of the organization Syrian? The physical heart of the organization is Syrian. And I would say most of, of the fighters for it are probably Iraqi um, with a large Syrian contingent as well. But of course, I suppose in this part of the world, uh, those are not always hard and fast distinctions as people have been moving back and forth across the border. Yes, exactly right. The, the Sunni tribes that, that have straddled the border have, have always had close connections. And um, you know, the obliteration of the border is something they, they welcomed because they have family on both sides. And what is it that allowed them to be as state-like as they are? Is it the strength of their ideology? Is it their competence uh, at administration? Is there something else at work? I think it's, it's mostly a matter of neglect. Um, it, it doesn't take much to be a plausible state if the alternative is, is true chaos, which is really what, what uh, is, is the case in much of Syria outside of the areas that are strongly held by Bashar al-Assad and now strongly held by ISIS. Let's talk a bit more about the Islamic State's ideology. Now, there are a variety of different Salafi groups, including Al-Qaeda, yet, you know, again, the Islamic State has taken Salafi ideology in a different kind of direction, and it's fused it with uh, its ideas of statehood in a particularly distinctive way. Yes, so different Salafi groups have different views toward jihad. Not all of them are actually in favor of, of violent insurrection. And some of them believe that really what a Salafi, who again is someone who has to, who is trying to look back to the early days of Islam and replicate it, they believe that really it's a matter of personal purification at the family level. Um, and they believe that as a result of that, if they have an Islamic leader who might even be Hosni Mubarak, who might be uh, the king of Jordan, then that's fine. Those people should be allowed to, to remain in political control while personally they would be purifying themselves by trying to be as much like the Prophet and his companions as possible. Now, when the Islamic State came to be, they said, actually, we do have a proper Islamic leader already. And you can do your personal purification, but you don't any longer have to wait for the ideal Islamic leader to arise. And that was only possible because the Islamic State had territory that it can, could control and in June when it declared itself a caliphate. Which, again, means that it con considered itself, because of its declaration of a caliphate, the one true leader of all Muslims. But what does it mean to be a caliphate, exactly? So the word caliph, or caliph, uh, comes from the word to succeed. It means a successor, and technically it's the successor to Muhammad. Um, it's a so, rather grand claim for an Islamic organization to make. Indeed, although it's been made many times in the past. Uh, and for Sunni Muslims, there are really four caliphs who are considered uh, righteously guided, rightly guided caliphs. Uh, and those were the, the first four after the Prophet Muhammad. After that, there have been other caliphates, such as the Ottoman caliphs, the uh, Abbasids, uh, the Umayyads. And most of these uh, were really quite worldly people. They didn't have the personal imprimatur of the prophet, and um, they made mistakes, uh, they were morally flawed, and as a result, Salafis, and especially the Islamic State, don't even believe that these were caliphs, but they believe that they have succeeded the last righteous one over a thousand years ago, and uh, now the current caliph, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, is, I believe, number eight in their list of caliphs. Can you tell us a, a bit about what it takes to be a caliph? Yes. So one of the things that characterizes the Islamic State is that it, whatever standards it can find, it adheres to them. It's extremely punctilious in that regard. And to be a caliph, you have to be a Muslim man. You have to be devout. Uh, you have to be physically intact. So if you're missing an ear or a finger or a leg or an eye, then you're out of the running. And this is actually quite important since many of these people are 
bomb makers that they have been fighting. So it's not, um, not out of the question that someone might have lost a finger. Mm. Baghdadi has not. And then the final, uh, the final important characteristic of a caliph is he has to be descended from the tribe of Quraysh, which is the tribe of the Prophet Muhammad. And that is something that Baghdadi can plausibly claim. And it's not something that, for example, Osama bin Laden could not. Um, everyone knew where bin Laden came from, and he, he couldn't say, as Baghdadi can, that somewhere in his distant past he had a, a Quraysh lineage. Now, you know, these standards are certainly uh, pretty rigorous, and, and not everyone can meet them, uh, yet they're not impossible to meet. So why is it that other uh, Islamic organizations have not declared themselves to be caliphates in the past or, or declared you know, their leaders to be uh, caliphs? Well, first of all, some of them have. Um, some people consider Mullah Omar of the Taliban a caliph, even though he's missing an eye. Uh, there's actually a Mauritanian jurist named Shinkiti who says that the Islamic State can't possibly be the Islamic State because Mullah Omar is already the caliph. Um, but th the other reason, and the more important one, why people haven't declared themselves caliph in the past is that it simply sounds ridiculous. It would be for, say, um, a, a European fascist to claim to be the emperor of Rome, the Holy Roman Emperor, or to, to be a member of the Knights of the Round Table. It, it's just a, a very antique kind of claim that really makes no sense to the way most Muslims live in the modern world. So the Islamic State is very literal in trying to return to the time uh, of early Islam, to the time of the Prophet, uh, in terms of uh, you know, the punishments they mete out, uh, in terms of how they choose to govern their territory. Is that a fair characterization? Yes, it's, it's exactly right. And in ways that um, sometimes seems confusing to people who are, are unaware of Islamic history, um, they mete out punishment as the Quran dictates, but they also use some of the practices of governing that the Prophet is, is said to have used as well. So when they talk about truces, for example, with other groups, they speak of hudna, which is a type of treaty that the Prophet himself signed and therefore approved. So um, every little thing really is a way to hearken back to the early days of Islam. And if, if what they're doing is any different from those early days, then it's considered an innovation. They call it a rep reprehensible innovation, and therefore out of the bounds of what a, a leader of an Islamic state can do. Clearly now there are many governments, both in the region and in the West, uh, that have committed themselves to degrading and ultimately defeating the Islamic State. Uh, so you know, there are many people who are wondering, well, how exactly can we do this? This is a group that's kind of uh, arisen very quickly, that seems very formidable in many respects. So, so how does this, you know, um, this effort to defeat ISIS relate, or I should say the Islamic State, relate to its ideology? Well, one thing that, that it believes is that it has to have a caliph, and the caliph is leading the entire Islamic State. And that means that it doesn't really work in a kind of cellular way, the way that Al-Qaeda typically did. So Al-Qaeda operated in a cellular way where there might have been a small group of people who were in an apartment somewhere who were building bombs, whereas the caliphate really has a top-down structure. And it, it requires both the way it governs itself, but also to sort of pass the laugh test of calling itself a caliphate, to control territory and to expand. When it stops doing that, it stops looking like a caliphate. And certainly when it scatters to the winds after being blown apart, as, it, as may very well happen, then it starts looking a lot less credible as, uh, as the ideological claimant that it is. That is to say, if the Islamic State starts losing territory, and if its leader, uh, the caliph, uh, is killed, then these are major blows to the organization. In a propaganda sense, certainly. Um, of course, practically, to destroy the state would, would be a, a major blow against the organization, too. But insofar as it's drawing people in by the claim that this is the true successor to the Prophet Muhammad, then yes, the, the, the more dead he is or the more ridiculous he looks, the less uh, plausible he is as, as, a, as a real successor. Now, there is also this dimension of uh, Muslim prophecy as well that plays in here. Uh, given the punctiliousness of the Islamic State, given how literally uh, they take uh, you know, Quranic teachings, um, it actually offers us some predictions as to when the world will end and much else. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Uh, this is rarely spoken of, but in the, in the predictions of the clerics who are on the side of the Islamic State, they are very specific about how they believe the the world will end and how the caliphs will play into that. Um, they believe that there are a dozen caliphs in all of history. Uh, they believe that the current caliph is number eight. Uh, you can do the math. There's only a few more caliphs to go. 
And they also believe that the name of the final one, who is also known as the Mahdi, is foretold, and that will be Muhammad ibn Abdullah. So if the last one's already named and we're on number eight, uh, if you start killing caliphs, then uh, you um, make the last one um, show up all that much sooner. They also believe that the world will end in a particular preordained date, which is the year 1500 on the Islamic calendar, and for us that's 2076. And by the way, they believe that will happen in Syria. Um, this is a, a long-standing prediction that the Prophet Jesus would come to the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus and the end of the world, the major events of it, would happen in Syria and ultimately in Jerusalem. Thanks very much, Graham. Thanks for having me.